Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Book Time with Elvis with me, Mark. And well, today I'm stealing. I'm stealing from Michael K. Vaughan. Yesterday he released a video called um, Penguin Classics That Don't Exist But Should. And this is something I have long wondered, actually, why some books are in the Penguin Classics series and others are not. And uh, I had a few that I would certainly like to see in that series, and then I just bumped it up to ten to be like uh, like Michael. I have a feeling this may turn into some kind of tag. I'm sure somebody will weaponize it, but I don't think that somebody's going to be me. Um, but as Michael said, if anyone else wants to do it, you have a booktube channel, make a video about it, or if you want to tell me your ten, uh, leave them in the comments below. Um, so the first book that I would like to see as a Penguin classic is one called The Island, um, which is written by Anton Chekhov. Um, the English title is actually The Island, A Journey to Sakhalin, and it was published between 1891 and 1893, and it's kind of um, travel notes, if you like, of his journey to the island. If you don't know where Sakhalin is, it's uh, an island uh, in the far east of Russia, just north of Hokkaido in Japan. And I became kind of interested in it because um, when I was standing uh, on the uh, Wakanai Peninsula of Hokkaido, you can see the outline of Sakhalin Island, and I spoke to a few people who had been there, and it just seemed kind of a mysterious place. Chekhov, as I said, went there um, in 1890. He was very ill at the time. Uh, and it's kind of like, almost a bit like a report, I suppose, of what's going on at the penal, con penal colony there. Um, it is extremely grim reading, but I think a fascinating uh, piece of um, social history, if you like. Uh, it is quite long. I do have a copy of it uh, in the 1967 English translation, um, but there's no Penguin version of it. Uh, Perhaps I can understand why. I mean, it might not be everybody's cup of tea, but I think I think it would be fascinating. So, I, I, yeah, my vote is definitely to have a, a Penguin Classics version of The Island by Anton Chekhov. My next one is maybe a somewhat uh, controversial choice, uh, as the author is seen to be a bit controversial, as he's quite popular with uh, quite conservative homeschoolers in the, in the United States. But he's the Victorian writer G.A. Henty. And he was very prolific, wrote tons of books, uh, mostly for young boys. And if you like, he is the uh, father of the uh, boy's own adventure. And I think that's still quite an important thing. Although some of the views he expresses are, of course, outdated, I think it would be, again, uh, a, a good part of uh, literary history to have at least one of his books uh, in a Penguin Classics edition. So I went for his first book. Probably not his best book, but uh, one that I actually enjoyed, and it's called uh, Out on the Pampas, or The Young Settlers, and it was written in 1870. It follows the story of a family who emigrate from England to uh, the Pampas of Argentina, and they try to make a new life for themselves, uh, despite all, that, uh, um, all the obstacles that are thrown at them. And it's good fun, you know. Um, again, as I say, perhaps some parts can be... Uh, rather uncomfortable to a modern audience, but then there are still plenty of Penguin classics that are. So I think to omit someone as prolific as Henty is an oversight on the uh, an oversight by the uh, publisher uh, publishers at Penguin. Next, I'm going to go with a Polish book actually, but it's quite well known. It's called Quo Vadis, and it's written by uh, Henryk uh, Sienkiewicz. I hope I pronounced that right. And basically, this is a kind of uh, historical fiction, a narrative, if you like, that takes place during the days of Nero. Uh, it's kind of, well, it's a love story. Uh, it takes place between a, a Christian woman and a heathen Roman patrician. Uh, and this all takes place during the rule of the Emperor Nero. Um, Sienkiewicz really gives a good... Uh, description of Rome. You can tell he studied it really extensively and researched uh, researching very well. Um, he tries uh, definitely to get all the historical details correct and uh, you know several real historical figures do 
uh, appear in the book. Yes, undoubtedly the uh, book does carry a very pro-Christian message, but you know, it doesn't detract uh, from its enjoyment if you happen to be a non-religious person. Originally the book was published in a uh, Polish uh, magazine or newspaper in different installments uh, between 1895 and 1896, uh, and it was finally published uh, in a book in 1896 and subsequently translated into uh, over 50 different languages. Uh, Sienkiewicz actually won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1905, and this novel would have been a big part in that. Uh, you may, of course, know that uh, there have been several film adaptations or TV adaptations of this work, uh, especially, probably, I would say the most famous is the uh, 1951 film version starring Peter Ustinov as uh, the Emperor Nero. Uh, next up, we have... Um, we have a novel called Cleopatra, and this is a novel by H. Ryder Haggard. Now, Michael mentioned H. Ryder Haggard uh, in his video yesterday, and I just want to back him up. I absolutely agree. Haggard is somebody who deserves and needs to be back in print, and he is pretty much only known uh, for um, King Solomon's Mines, which is part of the Alan Quartermain series, and she, part of the Aisha series. Um, and it's a shame because the man was absolutely prolific and he wrote tons of good stuff. Uh, the one, as I said, I'm going to choose is Cleopatra, published in 1889. And it's basically a story of the Ptolemaic era of ancient Egypt, of course, uh, of which Cleopatra was a part. And um, it kind of looks at um, how this uh, cult of Isis or kind of priesthood surrounding the cult of Isis uh, look to uh, protect the dynasty. Uh, the main character, who is kind of the, um, uh, where the POV comes in, is a chap called uh, Harmachis, and he is a living descendant, actually, of the pharaoh's uh, bloodline, and he believes that uh, Cleopatra is uh, an imposter um, and he doesn't want to see the Greeks and Romans uh, in Egypt and his aim is to kind of drive them, drive them out. Um, again, I think what's surprising about this book is Haggard's uh, depiction of Cleopatra. He does paint a picture of a very strong uh, woman there. Uh, the language is somewhat archaic for this because I think he tries to retell it in a, in a biblical language and uh, the idea is that it's told from a series of uh, papyric or papyrus uh, scrolls uh, that had been found uh, in an Egyptian tomb. Next up we have a book I read at the beginning of the year which I absolutely loved and it did once exist as a Penguin classic however uh, it doesn't seem to exist anymore and that's PC Wren's uh, adventure novel Beau Geste, uh, which kind of uh, which talks about the adventures of three English brothers who separately enlist in the French Foreign Legion uh, following the theft of a very valuable jewel uh, from a relative of theirs. This was published in 1924, uh, though it's set in the period before the First World War. Again, it has also been adapted uh, for the screen several times as a silent film of it and a couple of uh, talkies as well. Um, Wren wrote two sequels to this book, Beau Sabreur in 1926 and uh, Beau Ideal in 1927. To be honest, I would love to see the whole trilogy in uh, Penguin Classics edition. Next we have a favourite of mine, which does appear in the Penguin Classics in some form, but it doesn't appear in its entirety. It is uh, an abridgment uh, and uh, or even maybe perhaps an anthology or selection and that is a dictionary of the English language uh, by Dr Samuel Johnson published in 1755. It is among one of the most influential dictionaries ever published uh, in the history of English and, and English language and uh, it was originally published in two volumes and I think it would be fantastic if uh, Penguin published both volumes in their entirety. It would be of course uh, massive undertaking but it would be uh, fantastic because I would imagine the kind of notes and 
footnotes and annotations you would get with that would be something outstanding. Next up, we have a 1902 adventure novel uh, called The Four Feathers, which you may know uh, also from two film adaptations. Uh, it's by a writer called A.W. Mason, who uh, again was fairly prolific and extremely popular in his day, but has fallen out of popularity. Uh, this is a interesting novel that takes place in in the Sudan in the backdrop of the Mahdist War, um, which was uh, kind of an early uh, Islamic extremism where these uh, fundamentalists led by the, the so-called Mad Mahdi uh, rose up against Egyptian uh, rule, but uh, the Egyptians are backed up by the British and of course things went disastrously wrong and um, the British ended up having to commit themselves uh, with uh, big number of troops and on the eve uh, before his um, unit was due to sail the main character Harry Feathersham uh, decides to quit the army because he wants to marry his girlfriend and he's you know he feels he's done his bit he'd served some time in India and that kind of thing uh, however this is perceived as cowardice and uh, three of his friends give him um, a white feather which was a symbol of cowardice uh, at the time still used up to the First World War uh, the fourth feather comes in because his fiance gives him one and of course uh, that um, breaks up uh, the engagement and um, Feathersham decides to uh, redeem himself by making everybody take back those feathers by traveling off his own back to Egypt and Sudan uh, and performing heroic feats uh, to make these people take back uh, the feathers that they gave him and kind of redeem himself in the eyes of uh, people important in his life and also of course to win back uh, his now estranged uh, fiance. The next two I'd like to see are actually Czech books, um, not Czech books like to do with banking but from Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic or the Czech lands, whatever you like. Uh, the first one is uh, in Czech, Kitice z Povesti Narodnich which is a bouquet of folk legends. Uh, it's often shortened to Kititsa, or in English, uh, the bouquet or a bouquet. And um, this is a collection of uh, poems or ballads by the um, Czech, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, he led, he is part of the movement that led the revival of the, uh, of the Czech language uh, by Czech author Karol Jaromir Erben and um, it's quite terrifying a lot of the uh, poems and stories within this book they are definitely horror you have for example i've read it a couple of times on this channel i did i think i did one on poetry thursday and um, in another video one polenica which is about a uh, which is the, the, the noon witch and uh, in the story she uh, knocks on the door to come and get naughty children and uh, in the poem, the mother's clutching her child uh, tightly to her breast uh, and in fear, she sees like the door handle turning and uh, ends up basically suffocating the child herself and, and killing it. So it's very grim and very dark. There's a, another famous story in there, the Vodnik or the, the water sprite, uh, which is about these kind of green men that live in bodies of water within the Czech Republic, be they ponds or lakes or rivers even. And uh, if you're swimming, they will grab you and they will pull you down and drown you and then keep your soul uh, in a in a in a alabaster jar or a pottery jar something like that uh, so they're not very nice creatures uh, but I think it would be very interesting to see um, you know some of these books in uh, Penguin Classic editions after all I mean there's plenty of translated works and not much in the Czech line. I mean, there is the Good Soldier Schweik by Yaroslav Hasek, but not much else. And I think it would be fantastic to see that. Uh, as I said, the next one is also Czech, and it's the uh, Podvinky Malostranské, uh, which in English is Tales of the Lesser Quarter, or also it's published as um, uh, Prague Tales. Um, you know, both of these are available in English, but uh, there's not breadth of translation. Kitisa only has two translations into English. I'm not sure even Prague Tales, has, I mean Prague Tales seems to only have one, um, at least one slightly modern one, 
Um, and what it is, is a collection of short stories uh, written by the Czech uh, writer Jan Neruda, and he wrote it in, uh, we published it in 1878, and it is definitely his most popular work, and it is an important text for understanding life, um, social history again, of, uh, well, I guess it was uh, Bohemia at the time rather than Czechoslovakia or Czech Republic because it was part of uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, but all the stories take place within the, the Malastrana or the little district or little quarter of, of Prague, which still exists today. And it looks at the lives of just ordinary city dwellers, you know, from different walks of life. Uh, okay, we come to the last one, uh, which is a fairly recent read for me, but I really loved it, and I do think it deserves uh, its own Penguin Classic, uh, because it isn't, any, it isn't anything like you would expect, and that is The House Without a Key, which is 19, a 1925 book by Earl de Biggers, and it is indeed the first Charlie Chan uh, mystery. Um, it's set in Hawaii during the 1920s, and um, basically there's a there's a murder, um, and the yeah I've talked about it before, so I'm not going to drag out this video by talking about it too much. But there's a murder, and um, we kind of just look at what's happening through the eyes of you know both uh, the the white uh, people who live on Hawaii and, and the non-white people who live on Hawaii, and there's a lot of a description about what Hawaii was like uh, both during the end of the 19th century and through to the 1920s. There's also some nice descriptions about uh, local Hawaiian culture. And interestingly enough, although um, you know it's not certain that Charlie Chan was meant to be uh, the main uh, hero of this story because I think uh, he doesn't appear until over 80 pages into the book. Uh, but once he does, he leaves a, a mark on it he won't forget. And, you know, there are, as I've said before, elements of uh, being made to feel uncomfortable due to terminology used, but it's unusual that that terminology, in fact, I can't think if that terminology is used by the author himself, uh, but by some of his characters, because I would say his portrayal of Chan is very sympathetic, and Chan is definitely the hero and uh, becomes a well-respected person by all uh, parts of uh, Hawaiian society. So there we go. Th those are my 10 picks uh, for uh, Michael's wonderful uh, Penguin classics that don't exist but should. And I invite you to do the same. I was, uh, I was able to find a nice mock-up uh, website. It's free uh, and it's good fun. I will leave the link to that below if you want to do it. Um, so yeah. And I hope you do do it. And, and please, if you don't want to make a video on it, then uh, leave some of your suggestions in the comments below. I think what's nice is uh, this fits in quite nicely with something uh, Sean D. Slamfast and myself are doing, which is the misplaced authors, looking at authors that have kind of dropped off our radar. And um, they're not necessarily forgotten because, you know, one or two of their most famous works exist, but uh, with the likes of Haggard or um, Henty, or uh, Arthur Conan Doyle even, they wrote a lot of stuff, and we seem to only know a couple of it, you know, small small parts of it, and uh, I think that's a real shame, and uh, certainly I know Sean and I are on a mission to try and bring some of that back into, uh, you know, in, into uh, our community, as it were. So thank you very much for watching. Do have a great day, and I will be back very soon, I'm sure. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.